boundaries of the meaning and uses of function words, which fulfill grammatical roles, but have little lexical meaning in comparison with content words, which have lexical meaning, are vague, indistinct, and hard to determine in any language. It is likewise difficult to discern the impact of language contact on its meanings and uses and on their outcome in terms of loan shifts resulting from semantic borrowings and extensions. These difficulties occur in regard to biblical Hebrew function words as well, leading to disagreement and dispute over the variety of meanings which should be ascribed to different function words, their nuances, and the scope of their usage. As we will see now, such dispute emerges in investigating major scholarly works addressing the overall meanings and uses of the particle hen in biblical Hebrew. Dictionaries of biblical Hebrew usually first give the basic meaning of hen as a presentative or emphatic particle and compare it with the biblical presentative hene, whose meaning and use are similar. The particle hen overlaps hene in introducing direct speech. Another meaning of hen generally given in these dictionaries is im if, whether. In other words, it serves as a conditional particle or to introduce an indirect question. Whereas this letter sense is generally not ascribed to Hine in Biblical Hebrew, in Aramaic it is the standard meaning of the particle Hen and is well documented in Biblical Aramaic. Accordingly, various biblical Hebrew grammars and other scholarly studies have suggested that the meaning if, im, for hen in biblical Hebrew derived from Aramaic. As Gesenius Hebrew grammar notes, then if generally supposed to be originally identical with hen, behold. Probably, however, an if is a pure Aramaism, and since the Aramaic word never has the meaning behold, it is at least improbable that it had originally any connection with hen or hine. The grammar of that's end of quote. The grammar of biblical Hebrew by Joan and Muaoka similarly indicates that hen, meaning if, is, as a quote, as in Aramaic and no doubt under Aramaic influence. The same is true of Walter and O'Connor introduction to biblical Hebrew syntax, which includes hen in its discussion of conditional clauses. Asberg too explains this use in the same way in his introduction to the syntax of biblical Hebrew in Hebrew. Occasionally hen and hine introduce the logical subject or topic theme of a sentence whose logical predicate, comment, or rim is a declarative clause, an interrogative clause, often rhetorical, or a clause expressing kal vachomer, all the more or all the less. The logical subject in such instances is also a clause, and it can be understood as a prothesis of a causal, temporal, or conditional clause to which serves an apodosis, as apodosis, a declarative, interrogative, or calvachomer, all the more, all the less close. Van der Merwe refers to this role of Hine, suggesting that it points to a proposition which needs to be related to another proposition or speech act. These syntactic Structures are some of the uses of hine and hen, which usually follow verbs of speech and introduce direct speech, as well as the hine, which usually follows verbs of sight, dreams, visions, and similar contexts, and introduces their content. 
they appear in both early and late biblical books. The following examples are taken from early biblical books whose language is generally classical biblical Hebrew. Declarative clauses serving as apodosis clauses are the following. One, Genesis 48:21, Vayomer Israel el Yosef, Hine Anochimet, Vehaya Elohim imachem, Vehishiv etchem, El Eretz avodchem. Then Israel said to Joseph, As I am about to die, God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your ancestors. Um, English translation are according to the NRSV, unless especially, I will mention it especially. Uh, two, Judges 4, 22, Vehinevarak Rodefet Sisra, Vatetse Yael Ikrato, then as Barak came in pursuit of Sisra, Yael went out to meet him. Three, Genesis 4, 14, Hen gerashta oti hayom me'al pene ha'adama u'mitpanecha esater, והייתי נע ונד בארץ, והיה כל מוצאי להרגני. As you have driven me away today from the soil, and I have to be hidden from your face, and be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, anyone who meets me may kill me. Interrogative clauses. Interrogative clauses, rhetorical questions, serving as apodosis clauses are the following. Uh, four, Judges 14, 16. He said to her, if I have not told my father or my mother, how should I tell you? Five, Ezekiel 13, 12. When the wall falls, will it not be said to you, where is the whitewash you smeared on it? And 6, Exodus 6, 12, And the Israel not listen to me, if the Israelites have not listened to me, how, they shall, how then shall Pharaoh listen to me, poor speaker that I am. And similarly seven, Exodus 6.30, Since I'm a poor speaker, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Kal v'chomer, all the more or less clauses, introduced by Afki, how much more or less, serving as a part of these clauses are the following. 1 Samuel 23, 3, But David's men said to him, If we are afraid here in Judah, how much more if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And 9, Deuteronomy 31, 27, And if you already have been so rebellious towards the Lord while I am still alive among you, how much more so after my death? Notwithstanding, various scholars disagree with this interpretation and the possible deriv derivation of the conditional meaning of the particles hine, the hine and hen from the Aramaic hen in part or in full. In 1973, Labuchain rejected the attribution of this use of, to our make and suggested that it evolved from the basic Hebrew meaning of the particles. His primary argument was that our make could only have influenced the particle hen, which exists in our make and not hine and vehine. Additional, support for this view is that use of hine and vehine to introduce causal, temporal, and conditional clauses emerged in classical biblical Hebrew, a language stage to which the Aramaic impact was not yet significant. Other scholars go further in disputing not just the Aramaic origin of 
use of n as a conditional particle, but it's very existence. Steck in 1987 argues that hen introducing conditional clauses has not acquired the meaning if, and that its role there is merely presentative, whereas the protesis clauses gained their conditional nuance in other ways. Gar assumes hen is a modal particle expressing affirmation in most occurrences, not condition. According to Steck and Gar, Gar, by the way, is uh, 2004, his article in 2004, according to Steck and Gar, if there were no conditional particle hen in biblical Hebrew, it clearly did not evolve from Aramaic and could not reflect Aramaic influence on biblical Hebrew. As I just indicated, an inner development of the meaning and use of hine, the hine and hen to particles introducing conditional clauses can be traced in classical biblical Hebrew. These particles primarily serve as presentatives, whereas hen is additionally an affirmative or a severative particle. They also, however, occasionally introduce temporal or conditional clauses with their meaning similar to that of a conditional particle. As has been demonstrated just now with examples from classical biblical Hebrew. Moreover, the particle hen in this role is commonly seen in late biblical Hebrew, particularly in the book of Job. In some late biblical Hebrew examples, it seems to continue classical biblical Hebrew usage as in the following examples. So the Podesis clause displays an interrogative clause or a clause introduced by Afki, how much more or less. Note that the first example is from the classical biblical Hebrew language of Jeremiah and marks perhaps a, transi transitional, <laughs> a transitional period. Interrogative clauses serving as apodosis clauses are 10, Jeremiah 3, 1. If a man divorce, divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's wife, will he return to her? 11, Chagai 2, 12, He nisa ish besar kodesh b'chnaf b'gdo v'naga b'chnafo el alechem v'lanazid v'layain ha'ikdash v'el shemen v'el kol ma'achal. If one carries consecrated meat in the fold of one's garment and with the fold touches bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? And 12, Hen yachtof mi yeshivenu, Job 9, 12. He can snatch, and who can restrain him? By Greenstein, uh, he snatches away who can stop him, according to the NRSV, but perhaps better introduced by a conditional particle. If he snatches, who can restrain him? Calva Homer, all the more le or, or all the less clauses introduced by Afki, how much more or less serving as a apodosis clauses are the following. Job 15, 50, 15, 16, and lo yamin, the shamayim lo zaku ve'enav. Af ki nit'av ve'nelach ishote chamayim avla. If he puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his eyes, all the more one detested and depraved who drinks corruptions as though it were water. And 14, Job 25, 5, 6. If the moon cannot shine brightly enough and the stars are not pure in his eyes, then all the less a mortal, a maggot, all the less a son of a human, a worm. In Proverbs 11:31, Hen Tzadik Ba'aretz Yeshulam Afki Rasha V'chote. If the righteous 
are repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. And similarly with us alone. 16, Job 4, 18 to 19, and Ba'avadav lo yaminu v'malachav yusim tohola, af shokhnei vatei chomer asher ba'afar yesodam yedakum lifnei ash. If in his servants he puts no trust, and in his angels he finds fault, then all the more those who dwell in clay houses, whose foundation is in the dust. Nevertheless, in Job, there are other conditional clauses introduced by him. For example, 17, Job 12, 14, and Yaharos velo ibane. Translated as he can destroy it so it cannot be rebuilt by Greenstein, and with a conditional particle in the NRSV. If he tears down, no one can rebuild. 18, Job 12, 15, and Yatsor Bamaim Vivashu, translated as he can hold back the water so that things dry up by Greenstein and with a conditional particle in the NRSV. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. 19, Job 23, 8, and Kedem Ehelof Ve'enenu, translated as, but East I go, and he is not there, by Greenstein, and with a conditional particle in the NRSV. If I go forward, he is not there. And 20, Job 40, 23, and Yashok Nahar Lo Yachpoz, translated as if the river crashes against him, he will not be alarmed by Greenstein, and in the same manner with if, also in the NRSV. Possibly the following example, number 21, introduced by Hen, if weather also relates to the previous examples. Jeremiah 2.10 Ki ivru iyei chitiim ureu vekedar shilchu beitbonenu meod ureu henaita kazot. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look, send to kedar and examine with care. See if there has even been such a thing. These examples recall conditional clauses introduced by Hen if in Aramaic, and they are common in Job, a book known to have been subject to major Aramaic influence. The time frame in which most of Job was probably composed and in which the Aramaic language emerged as a major source of influence on Hebrew is the Persian period. It is very likely then that the use of Hen meaning if to introduce conditional clauses increased significantly in Hebrew in this period, and that it occurs, occurred in late biblical Hebrew, influenced by Aramaic. In the Aramaic in which the book of Daniel is written later still, and means solely if, without it functioning as a presentative or affirmative particle at all. References to this usage in biblical Aramaic in the books of Daniel and Ezra are abundant. One such example is 22, Daniel 2, 5, Hen la uvali itzamun. If you do not tell me both the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. And similarly, it's contrast in the subsequent verse, sorry, it was still here, 23, Daniel 2, 6. But if you do tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. The suggestion, suggestion that Aramaic was the source of this later use of hen as if introducing condi conditional clauses is further supported by the parallelism between hen 
statement in if in three processes of conditional clauses in the following examples. 25, 2.13 If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locust uh, the locust in uh, to devour the, the land or send pestilence among my people. This suggestion is further supported by the structural similarity between the use of hen and im in two adjacent verses in Job. The first mentions above as example 12 with hen. Uh, Job 9, 12, hen yachtof mi yeshivenu. If he snatches, who can restrain him? And the second with him, Job 9, 19, And if it's a matter of a legal proceeding, who can convince us? Another source which supports an Aramaic source for the conditional meaning if of the particle hen in late biblical Hebrew is the idiom, if it pleases the king, used in the book of Esther. This idiom is most probably a calc, a long translation of uh, possibly of a similar Aramaic idiom found in the book of Ezra, as um, noted by others. Examples 27, Ezra 7.3, Batan Hamelka Vatomar im Matatichen Benecha Melech im Matatichen without Dina as pointed by. Uh, Fassberg yesterday, um, following, I believe, um, Adina Mochavi, if I'm correct. Anyway, Batan is Teramal Kava Tomar, Ima Tzatichen Be'enecha, Hamelech, Ve'ima Lamelech Tov, Hinateli Nafshi Bish Elati, Ve'ami Bevakashati. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me, that is my petition and the lives of my people, that is my request. And 28, Ezra 5, 17. And now, if it pleases the king, have a search made in the royal archives there in Babylon. The parallel classical biblical Hebrew idiom, im matati chen benecha, matati na chen benecha, literally, if I have won your favor, which appears in Esther 7.3, just before ve'im al ha-melech tov, ve'im al ha-melech tov. It essentially reiterates the same meaning. It is highly likely that the latter idiom was easily absorbed in late Biblical Hebrew because it recalls two other classical Biblical Hebrew idioms, which rarely serve in conditional clauses, itav benei and tov benei, it pleases. The idiom itav benei, it pleases, appears only three times in late Biblical books, all in the book of Esther. The idiom tov benei, it pleases, occurs four times in late Biblical books, once in Esther, once in Zechariah, and twice in Chronicles. These two letter idioms demonstrated below in the book of Esther may well have been a major influence on the formation of the calc originating in Aramaic, Ve'im al HaMelech Tov, if it pleases the king. Um, 29, Vasarim from Esther 1.21, this advice pleased the king and officials. 30, Esther 2.4, And let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king and he did, did so. 31, the girl pleased him. And uh, 30, 32 now, Esther 8, 8, You may write as you please with regard to the Jews. 
Only two of the examples of Tov Be'nei Klises appear in classical biblical Hebrew in a conditional clause, similarly to the idiom Im Al HaMelech Tov, if it pleases the king. In the second example, it parallels the idiom Ba Be'nei, it does not please, also as a conditional clause. 1 Kings 21, 2, if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. And 34, Jeremiah 44, this is Jeremiah, so it may be a little later. Uh, if you wish, it pleases you. Uh, to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will take good care of you. But if you do not wish or it does not please you to come with me to Babylon, you need not come. The small number of such examples support the assumption that the idiom in these latter two examples is merely tov bene. It pleases and not the whole conditional clause. Nonetheless, its use in conditional clauses may have contributed to the creation of the Kalk im al hamelech tov, if it pleases the king, originating in Aramaic in the book of Esther. In conclusion, based on the data and analysis presented, interpretation of the role of Hine, Vehine, and Hen in certain examples as introducing conditional clauses in both classical and late biblical Hebrew, in addition to their primary representative or affirmative role, should not be rejected. Its inclusion of a conditional clause in the complete list of the functions of these particles should be based on diachronic considerations. Taking into account the examples, their analysis, and diachronic considerations, it is evident that the use of hine, the hine, and en to introduce conditional clauses evolved in classical biblical Hebrew, probably because of an inner development at this language stage. A secondary development occurred at, this, at the time when the later biblical books were composed from the Persian period onward when use of the Hebrew particle hen to introduce conditional clauses further expanded under the influence of the Aramaic conditional particle hen. This development most likely resulted from increasing contact between Hebrew and Aramaic in the Persian period. In late biblical Hebrew, it should therefore be regarded as a prominent instance of Kalk, a loan translation, of the Aramaic meaning of hen, functioning in Aramaic solely as a conditional particle. This led to a semantic expansion of the meaning and use of hen in biblical Hebrew, and to a new balance between its presentative or affirmative meaning on the one hand, and its conditional meaning on the other hand. This calc is especially prominent in translation of the idiom Imla Melech Tov, if it pleases the king, documented in the book of Esther. Because this semantic expansion concerned the meaning and use of a function word rather than a content word and related to the realm of syntax rather than that of lexicography, it is more obscure and less easily Discerned. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tamar, for a, a very uh, insightful lecture. Lots of very interesting points there. Um, if you could perhaps stop sharing uh, yeah. now. As I said, if you if you if you have any questions, perhaps you could just send me a note. Say you'd like to ask a question because I I can't see everybody. I don't think really large numbers of people or if not just speak up <laughs> unmute yourself and speak if that would be simpler for you as long as you don't all speak at the same time <laughs> um.
I think Noam, yes. I can see you. Yeah, hi, hi Jeffrey, hi Tamar. And I, I must apologize for missing the first few uh, minutes of your talk because I was teaching until four. So you may have said something about what I'm going to ask. Uh, so you'll just have to read. First of all, I would be happy to send you the um, you printed version or the PDF. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I have a sort of a method. Thank you very much for the for the paper. Uh, I think, I mean, for the uh, LBH material, I think the, the evidence is, is uh, striking and can't, can't be disputed really, or I can't dispute it, uh, but I would like to ask about the CBH material. And my question is really about methodology. I mean, even if one grants that the conditional reading of HEN there is possible, the, my question is, is it necessary? I mean, uh, uh, and how can we methodologically distinguish between the original coding of HEN in CBH, which might have been different, might have been a severity, for instance, or uh, uh, another with, uh, or presentative, uh, uh, and, and on the one hand, and the, under, the syntactic understanding which is implied by, for instance, the NRSV, that is European languages, which in a sort of a way impose their own syntax, on, on the understanding of Hebrew. So how can we distinguish uh, between the potential readings from the point of view of the ancient speakers of Hebrew? Yeah. So actually I believe this is the inner understanding of the text. So it's not an uh, uh, understanding that is imposed by other versions, mm. later version or European version, versions of the Bible. Also I see it as a continuum the nuance of conditional clause started there. Its roots are there, but it's but, only marginal in classical biblical Hebrew. It appears in several examples, not in all examples of Hine, Vehine, and Hen. And it goes farther later on. So it actually meets the Aramaic situation later on and picks it up again and uh, increases this use but it started already in classical biblical Hebrew. But it is, is just it necessary? There. Yeah, no, I understand your position, but I'm, what I'm asking, is it an obligatory understanding of Hen in those, in those passages from CBH? I mean, for, for Jeremiah 2.10, for instance, I would agree with you. I think it's, it's almost obligatory there. But for some other passages, I'm not entirely certain that this is a, a necessary understanding of the Hebrew. Well, I used the terms in the beginning of my lecture that you actually missed. Yeah. I, I used the terms um, theme and dream, mm -hmm. uh, topic and comment, and so on. And I believe that in conditional close, the first part is the topic, and the second is the comment. So actually what existed in classical biblical Hebrew is some kind of relation between topic and comment. And the exact role of the topic is sometimes obscure or it is still on the continuum. It can be understood as a conditional clause or another type of clause, which is the topic of what is coming. Mm -hmm. So that's the one edge of this continuum. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Can, can I just clarify, Tamar, because you are saying that this hen in the CBH is original CBH, yet you're not saying that it's somehow due to some rework. So that was, that's what that was the point, yeah. Yes, of course. That's part of the roles of Hinevi and Hen to mark uh, a topic, a close mm. functioning as a topic or a theme of a clo another close. So basically just a, 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 an allomorph of Hine, then. Is that what you're saying? Oh, again? An allomorph of Hine. Is that what, is that what you're um, saying? Yes, yes, yes. Right. So it, it, it is somehow it, the, the Aramaic understanding of the particle hen or its meaning in Aramaic influenced and, and increased this use of hen. But it was already there in classical biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, really. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tamar. It was very interesting. 
Uh, would you like to comment about the dating of uh, the poetry parts of Job to the Persian period? <laughs> but, uh, I think you you take it as a, as a starting point. So if you would like, yeah, I, like I actually follow following this issue uh, Greenstein and his wonderful translation, which is uh, really brilliant. But um, I somehow found found when I worked on the material. Uh, um, shall I say, uh, maybe uh, a nuance of avoidance. Uh, he tried to avoid the use of the conditional meaning of hen as much as he could. We, we saw it together in three examples out of four where he tried something else instead of if. So maybe he was trying to follow Ga or others in their understanding of this particle in different ways. So this is the only issue I dispute in his translation. But I, the, the um, connection of Job to the Persian period and all of this, I just counted what he said in his book, in his introduction, and uh, his understanding of uh, the, the time in which this uh, book was composed. So thanks. So just to, to continue the question, um, you, you've, you showed a lot of, of um, cases of Kal Vachomer in Job, and I just want to make sure that I understand you correctly. So the same patterns also appears in CBH, right? Not only with Hine, but also with Hen. Hen ve'odeni chai imachem ayom amrim eitem imadonai ve'afki achem oti. So that's exactly the same. Correct. Not in, just with Afki and Kal Vachomer, also with the interrogative clauses. Yeah, so you think yeah. that it became more similar to a conditional in later periods, although it, it was used for Kalva Homer already in earlier periods, but then it had a, a different function, a more... No, not at all. It, has the, it had the same function, but the use of it increased. It was marginal in classical biblical Hebrew, and they, they used it more in Job and in other later books. Okay. So the, the understanding or the knowledge of the meaning of the particle hen in our make influenced the use of these patterns, which emerged in classical Hebrew. Hmm. So uh, Harold Samuel though, has got a question. Harold. Uh, thank you. It's, it's just the, the one I've written to you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, just a simple question. How do you account for textual variation, especially in 1Q Isaiah A versus uh, MT then um, for your development? I mean, what role does textual criticism play for your evaluation of the data? Well, I, because especially I, in 1Q Isaiah, there's a lot of variation. Yeah, I, I actually didn't check this, this, uh, and these examples in other Bible variations, but uh, it is so rooted in classical biblical Hebrew and of course late biblical Hebrew that I don't see how it will influence my uh, conclusions if I check it. Uh, it is just there originally in biblical Hebrew. It is not an import of another uh, version or language or, or dialect or so. Hmm. Uh, Nama, you have a question, I believe. Yes. Um, so Conditional clauses have internal syntax that is, is quite different than um, hen clauses. Did you check? Because you talk a lot about the the um, wider syntax and how these the if clause is, is uh, functioning uh, broadly. But internally, did you look at the at the um, verbal forms, for example, that are used with um, the different meanings of hen? Because that could be you could actually find, I think, that when it functions as a um, as a conditional, it has a different internal syntax than when it's, it functions as a presentative. Well, I, I didn't check it this time, but I actually checked condition and clauses earlier in other works of mine. And um, there is a variety of use of verbal forms in conditional clauses, not only katal and so on, and, but a variety. So I don't see how it will change my um, conclusions regarding this, the existence of, of these types earlier, in an early stage in classical biblical Hebrew. Um, I found I find all types of 
um, verbs, iktol and katal, all of them in all these uh, clauses. Right, but they will have different meanings in conditional, right? Verbal, verbal forms would have different meanings in conditional clauses than they do in non-conditional clauses, which would affect how you read this sentence. I don't believe they will affect the example support here. No, uh, it, it is of course generally correct, but I don't think it will change the meaning of the examples that are brought here. Okay, I think, um, although we can be a bit relaxed this session, I think we better draw to a close. So thank you very much, Tamal, for, for your paper again. Thank you.